I'm here from Context, and I'd like to talk about home routers. So we've done some public research into home routers in the past. We've done some work on the Virgin Media Superhub, which is on our website. Um, we've done some other large ISPs privately. And uh, basically, I, I wanted to get in on the fun. So a bit of background about me. Um, I have a background in computer science and software development, and now I focus on penetration testing and research for context, uh, and I've got CCT app. So I'll go through a bit of why, why I did this research. The idea of hunting for backdoors, DNS rebinding, TR69, and then I'll sum up at the end. If you were at Cyber UK last month, this is the same talk, so feel free to leave the room and see something different. So you might have seen a bit of coverage last week, potentially, um, about Hyperoptic and their ZTE home routers. So the register covered it and a couple of other outlets. Um, so I've got my first suitably cheesy register headline. Um, but that was more of a high-level summary, so this will hopefully go into a bit more detail for the, for the techies among us to try and understand exactly what the vulnerabilities were and how they could have been exploited. So Hyperoptic, if you've not heard of them, they're a, uh, a smallish ISP focusing on high-speed fiber broadband. Um, the way it's set up is fiber to the premises and then ethernet within, within the building. So they, they primarily do blocks of flats and they're in cities like London and Manchester. The service is good from what I've seen. It's, uh, it's very fast. You can get up to one gigabit per second upload and download speeds. Um, but the router is not so good. So the router is made by ZTE. I looked at the, the H298N. Now, originally, my goal was to see if I could find vulnerabilities in the router without using a soldering iron, without using a screwdriver. You know, our, our research guys are experts in dumping firmware and JTAG and things like that, but that's not my strength, so I wanted to see what I could do from a web perspective, maybe from a malicious web page. Uh, so that was my focus. Now, some, some things they are doing well. Uh, as most home routers that you've all got, you, you get a unique SSID, you get a unique Wi-Fi password, uh, you get a unique admin username and password for the router. You know, it's, it's been sort of five years or so probably since major ISPs are sending out routers with admin admin. You now get a little, a little label on the back of the router that tells you your unique passwords. There is no access from the internet by default to the web interface uh, or to any other interface. So that's a, that's a good start. And the web interface has strong CSRF protections in all uh, pages which modify any parameters. So if it didn't have CSRF protections, then obviously there's a lot you can do from a malicious web page. You can generate a malicious request that automatically gets submitted to a customer's router and you, you can exploit it that way, but that wasn't possible here, so I had to look for uh, other ideas. So going back, to the cons going back to what I mentioned at the beginning about hunting for, for a backdoor type account. So I'd seen some research on the internet, some preliminary research by someone called Streetster, who'd done a teardown of this router and dumped the firmware. And there were signs there that there may be a, a hidden account so I wanted to go about trying to find this hidden account. So I thought, how, how am I going to do that? So the first thing I did was I mirrored the traffic on the WAN side of the router. So I can see what is coming into and out of the router on the internet side. You can do that with port mirroring or a throwing star LAN tap, something like that. I then opened up Wireshark. And then the final key to this was calling up customer support and telling them that my Wi-Fi wasn't working. So once I did that, I can see an incoming 
HTTP post request. And this is where the customer service agent is talking me through on the phone about you know, telling me which settings are disabled. And the incoming post request has username equals root and a password. So I got that, and I went back to my web interface in my router, and I logged in with the username and password, and it worked. So that was cool. I've found a username and password for my router, and this account gives you more access than the account which they tell you about on the label on the back of the router. So the username that they tell you about is admin, and that's the same username that, you know, the same kind of account that any one of us here have seen on our home routers when you log into the web interface. It allows you to change Wi-Fi settings, things like that. But the root account gave you access to more settings than you can modify with the admin account. So it's a more powerful account. So that was cool. I can fiddle about with my own router. But then the key blunder here is that I asked someone else uh, with the same router to try the password on their router, and it worked there as well. So we've now got a highly privileged account with a shared password that allows you access to every single router of the ISP if you can find a way to access the web interface. So I've been told not to call it a backdoor. So I'll just describe it as a customer services account with a hard-coded password that the customer doesn't know is there. Exactly. <laughs> so, but like I said, you, you, this by itself doesn't allow you to do anything because the web interface is not directly accessible from the internet. If you browse to the customer's public IP address on port 80, nothing, nothing happens. There's no response. And the CSRF protection that I mentioned previously doesn't allow you to submit these credentials um, to the router's web interface from, say, JavaScript in, in the customer's browser. So we had to look for something else. Now, hopefully, there's a few pen testers in the room. Put your hands up if you know what the same origin policy is. Good. I think Crest would be a bit worried if nobody knew the answer to that question. Um, so very briefly, same origin policy is the key security mechanism in web, web browsers that prevents one origin, which is a combination of a scheme, domain, and port, from reading or modifying the contents of another origin. For example, if you've got two tabs open in your web browser, one is gmail.com and the other is a malicious web page, the malicious web page can't just read and write into the other tab. Um, the same goes for iframes and things like that. Without this same origin policy, the web as we know it today wouldn't work. You could only have public information it would be like, you know, like the very beginnings of the web when Tim Berners-Lee invented it, which is just for sharing public information between universities. You couldn't have any confidential information. So if you can find a way to bypass this, then it's very useful. So hands up, who has heard of DNS rebinding? Okay, again, a few people. Keep your hands up if you know how it works. About three people. Yeah, it's... It's a tricky concept to understand. It took me a while to get my head around it. But essentially, it allows you to bypass the same origin policy. It tricks the web browser into thinking that your malicious web page and the web page you're trying to attack are actually on the same domain. And because the web browser thinks they're on the same domain, it allows the malicious web page to send requests to the target web page and receive responses. So it's, it's kind of a vulnerability of web browsers, but also of the tar target website. The web browsers do know about it, but it's difficult to fix uh, in a backwards compatible way because there are some things that rely on this. So how do you test for DNS rebinding in a, in a device you're looking at? First thing to do is add an entry to your host file. So you take the IP address of the device, you add an arbitrary arbitrary hostname, and then you try and load the web interface of the device using that arbitrary hostname. If the web interface appears and allows you to log in and interact with it, then the, the device is probably vulnerable to DNS rebinding. Uh, another, I have a quick question here for 
the pen testers, what is the difference between accessing the web interface via the IP address and via your arbitrary host name? The host header, yes, exactly. That's the only difference. So the, the details of DNS rebinding, um, it's quite difficult to get right. There's a lot of caching layers in between that can mess up your attempts at getting it right. There's also various browser quirks. Um, so this is a, a summary of it. I'm not going to go into the full details of it. Essentially, you take your attacking domain. In my case, I bought hackmyrouter.com because I thought that was fun. Uh, you set up your DNS records to point to your malicious web page. You then get your victim to go to that link, either via a phishing email or a tweet or you know, putting it on a public website somewhere. When your name server is queried, you return the initial IP address, which the user's browser then caches and loads your malicious web page from that IP address. What you then do is you immediately change the DNS record, which you can do with a low, low TTL, to point to the device you're targeting. So initially, you've got your public IP address, and then you switch the, the record to point to the private IP address, in this case, 192.168.1.1. The original attacking web page that they've loaded in the browser, you, you have your own JavaScript running there. The JavaScript waits two minutes, which is how long the browser caches DNS requests for. It then reloads in an iframe the exact same domain as the outer page, but this time the DNS record has changed. So between the loading the outer page and the iframe, the IP address has changed, but the browser thinks they're the same domain. So what you then do is you, you get the router web interface to appear in an iframe. So when you look at it, you've got your attacking web page and then the router's web interface, <clears throat> but the browser thinks they're the same. There is a second method of DNS rebinding that I'm not going to go into here, which can allow you to bypass that two-minute delay, but is a bit more complicated. So we have our customer support account and DNS rebinding. If we combine these two together, we can have a malicious web page send those credentials to the router, successfully authenticate, and then send any request it likes into the router's web interface and see any of the responses. So what, what can your malicious web page do? Well, anything that you can do in the router. You can change the Wi-Fi settings. You can modify the DNS servers, so you can subsequently hijack the DNS requests. You can drop all of the firewall rules this allows you not only to access the web interface then directly from the internet, so on subsequent attacks, or when you subsequently want to log into their router, you can just do it directly from the internet because you've dropped the firewall rules, so you don't need to DN use DNS rebinding after that. Or you can drop the firewall rules that prevent an attacker on the internet directly accessing devices on the LAN. So if you move a device to the DMZ, you can then attack laptops, printers, TVs, things like that. Another fun thing to do is the router, like a lot of home routers, has a USB port. If you plug a USB memory stick into the USB port, the router then shares those files over the network. Um, so you can enable this in the router's web interface, open it up to the internet, and you can then read the victim's USB key from the internet. And the final thing, has anybody here heard of TR69? Yep, a few people. Okay, so. This elevated account that I mentioned allows you to modify TR69 settings. The account that they tell you about doesn't allow you to do this. TR69 fills an entire talk by itself, so I won't go into many details other than to say there's a talk from DEF CON 22, which is really good, and it's on YouTube. It's essentially a management protocol for ISPs to manage their customer devices, such as routers. It's XML-based using SOAP. It uses some terminology like CPE, Customer Premises Equipment, which basically means the router, and ACS, which is Auto Configuration Server, which is on the ISP side. That's the management server. All connections are initiated from the router. So the router checks in with the ISP once per day and says, 
Are there any firmware updates? Are there any settings I need to change? Things like that. The ISP can respond to those daily pings and change any settings it wants, read the values of any settings, upgrade the firmware, things like that. So with the root account, you can change the URL of the management server. So what you can do is you can point that at your own malicious server. And you can then, when the router checks in with you daily, you can then re respond with any commands you want. This is another layer of persistent access. So you now don't need to use DNS rebinding. You don't even need to have direct access to uh, the web interface on their external IP address. The router itself will ask you what you want to do. Now, if you want to modify or, or intercept TR69, rather than setting up your own malicious server, which is, um, takes quite a bit of effort, what you can do is just man in the middle the legitimate TR69 traffic and inject various things. So the router in this case does no validation of the server-side certificate. There's no mutual authentication. So you can easily man in the middle it, intercept the SSL, uh, and the router doesn't complain at all. So what did I do with this? Well, even the privileged root account for the web interface still doesn't allow you to do everything that's possible on the router. So there are some things like enabling Telnet, for example, which is not possible for, through the root account, but is possible for the ISP to enable via TR69. So a man in the middle of TR69, this is what a response looks like from the server. And I've responded there in the middle. Uh, there's a parameter called telnet.enable, and you just set that to one. As soon as you do that, port 23 suddenly appears on, on the interface. Now, once you log in via Telnet to your own router, these are the kind of details that you see. Um, it's MIPS-based, Linux, BusyBox, SquashFS. These are things that we see on most uh, customer routers. You can interact with it. You can move files in and out via one of the partitions, which is writable. And you can generally, at that point, you've got full control of the router. If you, if you enable Telnet and then expose it to the internet, you can then log in with a root shell. You can do anything. You can redirect traffic, do anything. So we did come up with some recommendations specific to this research. So the main one is to check the HTTP host header. The router knows what IP address it should be accessed on. It knows its own IP address. So if the HTTP host header does not match the IP of the router itself, the request should just be rejected. Obviously, all the routers you sh should use strong and unique passwords per customer, or ideally, remove the hidden account entirely. The whole point of TR69 is it, it's a management protocol for ISPs to manage routers. So they already have that capability. You don't need uh, a dedicated account to specifically log into the web interface manually. TR69 should validate the certificate of the management server. And in general, you need thorough product assessments and thorough infrastructure assessments, because these kind of things are not going to get picked up uh, with just a brief glance at the device. So the disclosure timeline, we disclosed this uh, privately via WITCH, the consumer, uh, consumer rights organization that we partner with for consumer issues. They disclosed it to Hyproptic at the end of October. Hyproptic accepted the findings and committed to fixing them with ZTE on the 10th of November. In December, Hyproptic changed the hard-coded password to a new hard-coded password. Then uh, last week, at the beginning of last week, Hyproptic said that unique passwords had been rolled out to everyone. So at this point, we and which published our articles. The next day, I tested some additional devices and found that two of them still had the same password. So we queried that with Hyproptic. And then they came back to say that the, the rollout completed this Monday, so on the 30th. So as far as we can tell, uh, looking at a few devices, they now all have unique passwords. So 
the vulnerability is mitigated as far as I can tell. So we can now talk about it. Otherwise, I'd have had to last minute redact everything again, like I had to do at Cyber UK. Uh, thanks to Crest for having me. Thanks to Streetster on GitHub who did some preliminary research. I don't know who this person is, but they, they did a teardown of the router. Thanks to David, Caroline, Scott, Andy, and Paul at Context for their help with some ideas and with the disclosure. Thanks to Witch for uh, handling the disclosure, and thanks to Hyproptic for fixing it. So, in summary, I wanted to see whether it was possible to hack a home router from a malicious web page, and at least in this instance, it was. You can fully compromise every single aspect of the router. Uh, you can gain persistence. You can hijack DNS requests. You can monitor all inbound and outbound traffic because the router allows you to add static routes. You can block or redirect any, any content. You can inject content uh, into unencrypted pages. And if you compromise an entire ISP, say 100,000 customers, you've got a pretty extensive botnet that you can use for crypto mining, proxying your malicious traffic, or uh, a very high bandwidth distributed denial of service attack. So that is it. Thank you. Are there any questions that we'd like to ask Daniel? One here. Um, so the ISP, they don't mandate that you have to use their router. So you are allowed to use your own router, which may not have TR69 enabled. So it is, it is possible to disable TR69 and still have full service from the ISP. You just won't have the customer services people be able to log in and help you fix things potentially. But obviously, that's not necessary. OK, thanks. Hold on, wait a minute. Can you pass the mic over so people can hear the question? Is an attack like that practical at scale? Like DNS rebinding feels quite targeted to. Like uh, to it's a good question. DNS rebinding is tricky to exploit at scale, but it is possible. What I haven't weaponized it to that extent yet, but I do plan to. Um, basically, what you can do is when a customer reaches your malicious web page, you can generate a random subdomain and refer them to that so that every single visitor gets their own subdomain. And you can then do DNS rebinding on each subdomain individually. Obviously, as you're alluding to, if you've just got one domain and you have it return one IP address initially and then you switch it to a second IP address, every victim after the first one is going to then hit the router interface directly and it's not going to get your malicious web page. So it, it is tricky to do, but I believe it's possible and I'd like to at some point try and build that. Thanks. Okay, thank you everybody. In the interest of, in the interest of time, we'll have to um, end it there. So uh, thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks.